We are honored to have Dr. Robert Turnick give today's lecture. Dr. Turnick is currently a Senior Research Advisor for Synthetic Molecular Design and Development at Eli Lilly. He has a responsibility for creating and implementing drug product strategies across Lilly's synthetic molecular drug product portfolio. Dr. Turnick has over 30 years of experience in formulation and development and manufacturing process scale up and tech transfer. He has overseen the development of more than 40 pivotal clinical and commercial formulations. He sits on Lilly's pediatric steering committee and is actively engaged in both the US and European based pediatric product development consortium. Dr. Turnick is a pharmaceutical industry representative on the Federal Task Force on Research Specific to Pregnant Women and Lactating Women through HHS and NICHD. Please enjoy today's presentation. Welcome to the NIH Principles of Clinical Pharmacy course. I'm Dr. Robert Turnick, a Senior Advisor for Eli Lilly and Company, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about drug formulation and delivery. As disclosure, I am an employee and shareholder of Eli Lilly and Company. So what is this lecture about today? Today, we'd like to cover uh, a number of topics around the key patient, technical, and business considerations when we're converting a drug substance into a medicine with real focus on drug product design and development. So the learning objectives for today are um, really around a review of some principles of human-centered design that I find are really important in the broader context of drug product design and pharma, as well as critical quality attributes, um, a short discussion on different modalities, um, and then a, a lot of detail on some key attributes of drug substance, product design drivers, and routes of delivery, um, which will really form the, the basis of the talk. And towards the end, I'll touch very briefly on some pharmaceutical packaging, labeling, and device considerations, as well as a few thoughts on alternative administration and special populations. So as you can see, it's quite an ambitious agenda that we have to get through today. And so the, the real question is, is, is where do we start? And I think it really starts with the patient and this concept of design. So why design? We can take lessons from orthogonal industries like the food industry or automotive industry where we see the impact of, of design every day. And, and in the pharmaceutical industry, you may ask yourself, well, why, why would design be as important when we're not talking about, for example, a consumer product? And I think a lot of the reason goes back to just the evolution of healthcare and society, the autonomy that patients have these days with regard to choice and, and dictating their own treatment, as well as the autonomy of, of physicians and healthcare providers. So choice does become a matter of, of, of a conscious decision. And so if we look at, for example, I have on the, the, the image here around Heinz, right? You, you think Heinz sells ketchup. Well, they sell more than just the old 57, which in the glass bottle specialized in, in maybe getting spots on shirts, but as we, as we look at their evolution over the course of time, um, they have a variety of products available for, for anyone that um, uh, wants to use ketchup, whether they are diabetic or whether they are on a salt restriction. And, and so these are, are a simple illustration of the concept of design and designing for a co consumer and their needs and their use scenario. So how do we bring some of that same thinking into the pharma space is something that I'm very interested in, and it really all starts with improving um, patient outcomes. So we all know what bad design can look like, a, a porch on a building with no access, but what does good design really look like, um, and how do we get there from a pharmaceutic standpoint? A familiar example might be this little package here that you might have run into in a convenience store, and it, when you have a headache and you're looking to take your medicine, uh, and then you've got to fold and twist and pinch and tear and half the time the, the slot is in the wrong spot and you can't get the package open. And, and so a, a poor design, even if it's something as simple as, as, as packaging for an over-the-counter pain reliever can be a, a real source of frustration. And so um, this is the type of thing that we want to avoid as we think about product development in the pharmaceutical industry. So where do we start? We start with the patient. Um, and, and this concepts of human-centered design. 
and really about building partnerships with key stakeholders, uh, patients themselves, their caregivers, healthcare providers, regulators, and even payers, right? And, and, and for me, it's about keeping that patient, those therapeutic goals and their needs right, in front, so right front and center for the scientists and the engineers that are responsible for developing the product. And one nice way to do this is, is really by engaging in that conversation, um, being able to uh, understand, uh, build empathy through understanding patient situations and journeys. And this is a place where even though we may work as healthcare providers or scientists, we're, we're all people as well. And we have our own experiences in our, in our personal lives with regard to the healthcare system. And, uh, and, and those lessons learned and experiences can be very impactful in the way we think about the design of our products as well. So is this new to medicine? I, I don't think it is. And we can go back thousands of years and we can, we can see this quote from Hippocrates that it's far more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. And I think this really um, brings it home uh, in a very tangible way. Uh, how do you how do you understand your your patient your customer? So with that as a background or some lead in into the concept of design because you'll hear me use that word a lot. I want to talk about a few definitions that we'll also uh, frequently discuss today. Um, some terminology and and the main two here are, are drug substance and drug product. So um, the drug substance or the active pharmaceutical uh, our pharmaceutical ingredient. We'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, it, it really is that therapeutic um, modality. It's that substance that's intended to furnish the pharmacologic activity um, or affect the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease that affects the structure or function of the body. And so um, uh, on converse, uh, or in addition, we've got the drug product, which is really about that finished dosage form. And when I talk about product, I, I really am very inclusive with regard to not just the dosage form itself, but also any administration device or the packaging or labeling that goes along with that as well. But that's typically, that's that final dosage form, that tablet or capsule injection um, that is comprised of both that active ingredient, but as well, it comprised of a number of inactive ingredients that, are, um, that have an intended effect uh, in the performance of the drug product as well. In addition to um, uh, those terminologies, I'd like to uh, introduce the concept of critical quality attribute. And this is a physical, chemical, biological, or microbiological property or characteristic that needs to be controlled within a range or an appropriate limit to ensure that the product has the desired quality and performance. Um, both drug substance and drug products have critical quality attributes, and they're typically related to things like purity, biological activity, release of the drug, uh, the bioavailability, and the physical and chemical stability of the product. Um, some examples of critical quality attributes might include impurities um, in the drug substance or active pharmaceutical ingredient, um, the solid state form uh, of the drug substance that we would choose to put into a formulation, um, on a drug product side, it might be something like the disintegration time for an oral dispersible tablet. Um, if it's slow, if it doesn't disintegrate rapidly when a patient puts it in their mouth, it's not meeting the needs, it's not living up to the design expectation. And so that becomes a, a critical quality attribute. Similarly, things like taste for oral solutions um, for pediatric applications, sterility, um, for parenteral products of key importance as far as a, a critical quality attribute, and even things like adhesion of, uh, to the skin for a transdermal patch are, are nice examples of, of what we mean when we talk about CQAs. Those CQAs are, are a lot, in many instances associated with a, a particular specification for a product, but where we start in the design process is the establishment of a quality target product profile. And what the quality target product profile does is it forms the basis of the design. It establishes some targets early in the development process um, that allow the scientist engineer to say, look, if I can deliver against these, then I know that my product at the end of the day is gonna deliver the therapeutic outcome that, that we intend. And so <clears throat> concepts like the intended use in the clinical setting, um, the route of administration, the specific dosage form itself, 
Um, certainly the dosage strength or strengths that need to be developed and the flexibility um, to provide uh, different dosing um, over a diverse range of, of the patient population, the container closure system, um, the release characteristics, and we'll spend a bit of time talking about that later in, in, in the presentation, um, to ensuring that the pharmacokinetic characteristics, the absorption of the drug is really meeting the, uh, the therapeutic goal. And then, as I mentioned before, those, those um, established quality criteria that from a regulatory and a patient safety standpoint, we know that we need to deliver against, such as purity, um, stability um, for the product. So now I wanna talk a little bit about modalities and most of today's talk will be focused on small molecules. Um, they are the most common uh, type of drug substance uh, or, or therapeutic modality that is on the market today and, and certainly historically. These tend to be small molecules, small organic molecules that are either synthetically created or, or natural sourced and purified. Um, the nice things about these small molecules is that they're stable, they're very pure, potent, um, and can be relatively inexpensive to manufacture in contrast with some of the other modalities we'll talk about in just a second. And, and similarly, <clears throat> the small molecules will support many, many routes of administration, whereas some of the other newer modalities that are protein or peptide based are fairly constrained with regard to um, the way that those drugs can be formulated and delivered. Antibodies, um, the first approved in the United States in, in 1986 for a, a, an organ rejection uh, indication. Today, um, we see monoclonal antibodies um, advertised and, and marketed um, across the globe. There are many, many excellent therapies. They're highly uh, specific. Um, they're very pure. Um, the limitations are, are there as well. They're, they're more difficult to formulate because of the the structure of the molecules themselves, um, and, and really constrained primarily to parenteral uh, delivery. The peptide class of drugs is, uh, continues to be a, an emerging class, very similar in some regards to the antibodies. These are all proteins, if you will, sequences of amino acids. Peptides just tend to be smaller sequences, the two to 50 amino acid uh, sequence. The, again, primarily parenteral delivery, but I will mention in the semaglutide example here that I've got on the slide illustrates that there is emerging technology that's been developed and is continuing to be a keen interest in, uh, in, in the pharmaceutical uh, space around the delivery of, of small proteins or peptides orally. Um, and the drivers there are really around avoiding uh, uh, the, the need for injections. It will help with regard to convenience and compliance for patients. And, make the, the, the great therapies that these peptides have the potential to be more accessible to more people. Proteins um, are obviously more complex, um, large molecules, 3D structure that needs to be preserved to maintain their biological activity, um, present a real difficult formulation challenge, um, but, but still we see um, emerging technology and more and more, and more products based on, on proteins. And then certainly lastly, I wanted to talk about the CAR-T, siRNA, gene therapies. These are new and emerging modalities where the parenteral route is the primary route or exclusive route of administration. Um, and there are specific challenges to these modalities, which we won't get into today, but realize that as formulation science continues to evolve, we, we really need to um, be in a position where as these new modalities are developed, that the formulation science and the ability to deliver these specifically to the intended site in a way that is uh, accessible to healthcare providers and patients is going to be increasingly important. So let's talk a little bit um, very quickly about just some of those specific challenges, which I've, I've talked to um, uh, in the last slide or so. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. In fact, I'll probably just let you read through this slide yourself and say that I know that in the uh, curriculum for, for this course, you'll have uh, opportunity to learn more about the specific approaches to formulating and delivering peptides, proteins, and, R and RNAs. But here you can see a few of the key challenges that the formulation scientists would need to address. So let's 
talk about drug product. And we'll start with a, a very familiar example from a synthetic or small molecule standpoint, and that's acetaminophen. If you look on the label of the bottle, um, you'll see that that drug substance, that active pharmaceutical ingredient <clears throat> is acetaminophen. But yet we also see um, a significantly long list of other inactive ingredients, what we refer to as excipients, um, in that, on that label in that product as well. Um, so that, that overall presentation, the active ingredient, the, um, the excipients, and the formulation, uh, comp comprising the formulation along with the package, um, and as I mentioned, in those instances, if, if a device is required, and that label really uh, encompasses that entire definition of drug product. So why do we create formulations? And there are a number of reasons, um, both patient facing and, and, and uh, from a manufacturing standpoint that we look to. Um, key are around enhancing bioavailability, uh, potentially modifying or adjusting the input rate of drug from the dosage form into the patient. Um, many times we'll formulate to help improve the chemical stability of, of uh, a molecule that may have the less than desirable uh, druggable properties. Um, and then you can see some other drivers here as well, aiding in large scale manufacture, certainly things that would be um, more directed towards the patient. So for an oral uh, uh, liquid for pediatric application, certainly taste becomes a very important uh, attribute and something that we would uh, would look to develop a formulation, but through the use of excipients to uh, deliver a, a palatable formulation. Um, but it can also help with regard to safety, product identification, allow for blinding um, of products during uh, clinical trial um, work, and, and also, um, for example, the use of preservatives to maintain stability are all reasons why we may, um, <clears throat> why we create formulations. And you can see just the variety of, of, of drug product types that I've got on the slide here, the particular um, approach that we take and the materials that we use to create those formulations is going to be very diverse as well, depending upon the needs of the, the patient, the product, and our therapeutic outcome. So I've mentioned the word excipients a number of times now. And so just what are excipients? And these are materials that are formulated alongside the active ingredient of the medication that can play a, a real functional role. We talked about some of these um, particular uh, reasons why or, or reasons for inclusion of excipients. I really think a key here is, is, is keeping it simple. We don't wanna add material into a formulation unless we really need that material. And we also only want to put it in there at a level that is, um, that is sufficient to deliver the, the functional purpose for that material in the formulation in the first place. We don't wanna expose uh, patients to any, any more extraneous material than what we need to. The excipients themselves by nature are very inert. Um, these are all generally, um, generally regarded as safe materials. They have their own toxicology and safety packages that associate with them. Um, and so the inclusion of an excipient is, is typically um, a very safe proposition, but, but minimizing it, keeping it as simple as possible is, uh, um, is a key thought process for a formulator. And to enable that, we talk about um, very early in development, we, we do a lot of work on com excipient compatibility studies, which are very critical studies, which can very rapidly narrow us down to what are the proper excipients to use. A metaphor that a colleague of mine uses frequently is, is um, you know, going to the Chips Ahoy, the baking chocolate chip cookie uh, metaphor, where, where you know, if you consider that the active ingredient is the chocolate chip, the excipients are the flour and the sugar and the egg and the vanilla and the other, uh, and the other ingredients that go into that cookie that actually carry that chocolate chip, um, which we want uh, uh, um, in the cookie. And we want... Uh, all of our cookies to have a same or similar number of chips, um, not no, no chips in one and a lot of chips in other. And this is really the, the basic concept of incorporating the active ingredient into a formulation um, along with the excipients. So 
Now we're back to talking a little bit about drug substance. We talk about the excipients, the other components in the formulation, but obviously the, the key component in any drug product is the drug substance. And I wanna take a little deeper dive into those things that are, are really very important uh, from a critical quality attribute standpoint about the drug substance that can ultimately affect what's happening with the drug product. So recall those CQAs and, and what they relate to, um, the purity, the activity, um, the um, stability of the, of the drug product. And, and I really wanna hone in on how some of those drug substance critical quality attributes kind of carry through into um, the critical quality attributes of the drug product itself. We talk about purity on the drug substance. And, and um, I don't wanna, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the details here, but I think it's important to understand where these sources of impurities may come from and why they're there in these synthetic molecules. And so um, the, the syn synthetic schema, right, that is typically employed in a manufacture of a, of a drug substance can be extremely complex. And we'll take a look at an example in just a minute, but the organic impurities that come from um, the starting materials, the other intermediates, um, things that may be degradation products as a function of the reaction scheme, additional reagents or catalysts that are used, um, salts that might be used in the manufacturing process. And another really key class is, is the solvents. Um, the solvents that are used, all these reactions take place in the solution phase. Um, those solvents um, are, are very critical in, in the overall um, reaction schema for many APIs. And the judicious use and removal of those residual solvents is a key focus when it comes to uh, drug substance and, and, and purity. I, I want to call out specifically um, mutagenic impurities, which are DNA reactive substances that have the potential um, to interact with, with the DNA and, and can be a mutant uh, or carcinogenic in their, in their nature. And this is a very special class of impurity that we pay very, very close attention to as well. So let's talk a little bit about it through an example um, uh, of uh, on Vale Sartan. And this is something that has um, been in the, in the popular media over the last couple of years. And there's no quiz. I'm not gonna ask you to reproduce this in synthetic scheme. But what I really want you to focus on is, is the number of steps in the reaction, and then particularly the reagents and conditions that are listed in words below the figure. And you can see in there that there are a number of acronyms, number of solvents, um, DMF, in this particular interest, I'll draw, I'll draw your attention to dimethylformamide, but you can see salts, you can see nitrates, you can see a, a number of different temperature and um, time conditions that, are, that play in here. And so when you think about the reaction schema, um, there's all kinds of opportunity for side reactions, um, potential generation of impurities. And it's essential that the synthetic organic chemists really understand each step of the, of the schema and have a control strategy in place to, um, to either reduce or eliminate any um, any side reactions or impurities that may come through the, the schema. Through the ICH guidelines, there are very specific um, impurity control strategy requirements and specifications. We won't go into the detail here, but I think, um, again, you can look at this reference if you wanna learn more, um, but, it's, but these are very, very low thresholds. Um, these, these substances, our drug substances are extremely pure right, and tested to be such, um, and there's good reason why, why that is the case um, for the safety uh, of our patients. What happens when we lose control of, of a reaction schema? And it can happen, it has happened in the past, um, in spite of our best efforts, and most recently over the course of the last couple of years, you can see the, the byline, the date here, January 2019, um, a recall on medications, or additional recalls on the same medication, Valsartan, that we were talking about. And what happens through the course of time um, as, as, as more manufacturers um, uh, are producing the material, we're always looking, they're always looking for opportunities to um, improve efficiency, um, to save on cost, 
And in this particular instance, the API supplier altered a process um, and contaminated the API with a potential carcinogen, this NDMA, nitrosodimethylamine, and NDEA, and nitrosodiethylamine, which are known potential carcinogens, um, simply through the introduction of nitrates from uh, residual solvent and process water at very, very low levels. And yet it was enough to spur an unknown or unidentified at the time um, side reaction, which resulted in um, the presence of these potential carcinogens in the API. And what level are we really talking about? Down at the bottom line here, in, in the instance of NDMA and NDEA, the FDA put acceptable daily intake limits of just under um, 96 and, and 26.5 nanograms per day um, from a quantitative standpoint. These are extremely low levels. Of, of, of impurities in the, system, in, in the um, API, but yet at the same point in time, enough to trigger a recall from the market. These same concepts around drug purity um, are, and drug substance purity um, hold true for the biologicals as well. I won't go into the details here, but as is, is complex as the synthetic organic schemas are, um, when we're talking about the development of monoclonal antibodies um, or other cell-based um, uh, drug substances, you can see that um, the opportunity for the creation of adventitious viruses, um, fragments of host cell protein or DNA, um, molecular variants that would arise during the manufacture and storage, um, physical aggregation, um, aberrant glycosylation or deamidation. These are all things that um, when we're talking about making biologics can be um, key uh, impurities of concern. And so all these same concepts that we talk about for small molecule apply for those other modalities as well. So continuing on with drug substance, I wanna talk a little bit about now the solid state, the solid state chemical form of the material that is the active ingredient. And the chemical and physical stability of the drug product is largely dictated by the solid state and form of a drug substance. And generally we'll talk about this in, in, in two ways, crystalline substances and amorphous substances. So crystalline substances are those that have a, a very um, well-defined molecular structure um, and I'll give an example in a second. Um, amorphous materials are those that it's the same molecular composition, but yet that, 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 that structure, that arrangement of atoms within that, within that material is very disordered. And, um, and, and that can be an advantage and it can be a disadvantage depending upon the scenario. So why does solid state matter? Well, I mentioned that the, those amorphous materials um, can be a blessing or, and a curse. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the, the presentation. Generally, amorphous materials are higher. They have a higher uh, solubility um, and a higher dissolution rate. And we'll learn why that is very important um, later in the talk. But typically, these are much less chemically stable. There's a lot more molecular mobility in, a more, in an amorphous um, solid, um, and, and that would lead to a, a greater reactivity in certain environments and situations. They tend to be very hygroscopic. They want to pick up water, and you'll see in a minute that water is an extremely important player in the stability of amorphous materials, and they tend to be thermodynamically unstable. What, what an amorphous material wants to do is go to a more thermodynamically stable form, a crystalline form, and so if you start with an amorphous material, typically over time, that will want to become a crystalline material, the rate at which and the conditions of which that will happen can be very tremendously. And in fact, we can create amorphous stable uh, materials, but generally um, it is a less thermodynamically stable state. And then crystalline salts and polymorphs um, is, uh, is, is the other, I guess, major category that we'll talk about here. It could be a free base, it could be a salt. And within that crystalline structure, um, we can have different uh, crystal arrangements or different at, uh, atomic arrangements of those molecules. 
and and that will give us very different physical properties from solubility to melting point or dis dissolution rate and physical characteristics of the solid material as well. And these attributes can really affect the stability, the bioavailability, and the manufacturability of our drug products. So making sure that we're starting with the desired form and staying with the desired form throughout the, the, um, the, the drug substance manufacture and the drug product manufacture and the stability and in-use period is of critical importance. Here's an example of chemical stability impact based on an amor same molecule, but an amorphous Napa disolate salt versus the crystalline free base. And if you just draw your attention to that bottom boxes in, in red, you'll see, and I mentioned the importance of water, at those elevated temperatures of 40 and 50 degrees in the presence of water, 75% um, relative humidity, um, you can see that the amorphous material um, degrades very rapidly, less than 50% of the drug substance left after a 14 day period, as opposed to um, the crystalline free base, which even at those conditions of 40 and 50 degrees C with a high moisture content in the environment, they maintain their chemical stability. And this is a really important um, attribute in, in ensuring that you don't have uh, amorphous material in the instance that you're working to um, deliver a crystalline material and how it's important to stabilize an amorphous material if you're going to use that as your drug substance. So polymorphs, we'll talk a little bit more here on the crystalline side. I, I mentioned that, you know, can be the same chemical um, uh, composition, but yet those molecules or those atoms just arranged in a different way. And a classic example is graphite and diamond, right? It's carbon. And in one instance, depending upon the way that those atoms, those carbon atoms associate with one another, we have graphite. And in the other instance, just by simply changing the way that those um, carbon atoms interact with one another and the structure that they're in, we end up with diamond. And we can all appreciate the very different physical and chemical properties of, of graphite and diamond. So what can uh, the difference between a salt or a crystalline structure or a polymorph mean with regard to the property of bioavailability, the ability of the drug to get into the body and have the desired therapeutic effect. And this is a, a, just a simple example of a molecule that was developed in my organization a number of years ago, where we looked at both a hydrochloride salt form and a mesylate salt form, methane sulfonic acid um, salt form. And, and in an in vivo um, study, we were able to, in beagle dogs, we were able to look at the difference between the performance of those two um, salts of that same molecule. And you can see here in this instance that there was almost a threefold increase in exposure just based on the different counter ion, the different salt that we used. And so this is a nice example of how um, the solid state and form can affect the performance of a drug product. Well, what happens when we lose control of that form? Another example here, this one from 1998, um, with the Norvir or Ritonavir product that was an age drug, still is, that is used. And um, surprisingly, uh, in, in, uh, in the middle of 1998, several lots of the Norvir product failed the company's internal um, quality control dissolution test, um, which brought production to a halt um, and really interrupted the supply of this, at the time, very life-saving and, and critical medicine. So what's the story behind that? Um, as you can imagine, it goes back to the drug substance. It goes back to form. Um, at the time of, of the issue, there were over 240 lots of Norvir that had been successfully manufactured. But in the investigation around these dissolution failures, it was determined that there was a new unanticipated crystal form that had shown up in, um, in the drug substance that was um, being used to formulate the capsules and that this new polymorph had a significantly lower solubility relative to the desired form. And the consequence of that was not only a dissolution failure, but it significantly reduced the bioavailability to only 5% of the intended product um, bioavailability. And, and basically the product would be ineffective for achieving its therapeutic goal. So 
a nice example of how the, um, the drug substance and form can, um, and the control of that needs to be maintained to ensure product quality. So now we've talked a lot about drug substance and some key attributes. We'll come back to formulation a little bit here. And I really wanna focus on um, a couple of, of these, why do we create formulation um, bullets highlighted in red around enhancing bioavailability, modifying the rate of drug input. Um, um, we'll talk a little bit less about chemical stability, but, um, but we'll, talk, we'll mention that uh, briefly as well. And so um, what are those overall product design considerations around you know, why we formulate, when we formulate? And certainly, as I've already discussed, we need to understand the physical chemical properties of the drug. But in addition to that, we also want to really make sure that we're paying attention to what our therapeutic goals are. And this can be very impactful in the choice of the treatments that we, or the way that we would formulate um, uh, a drug and the type of drug product that we will ultimately develop. So if this is for an acute treatment like pain or migraine, we might take a different approach than if it was for a chronic treatment, for example, high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Um, we also think, very hard about what's where is the target? What's the desired effect? Is it systemic? Is it local? What's the site of action? And through this, we think about um, designing for that in vivo performance around these bio, what I'll call biopharmaceutical considerations. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, I'm really going to focus on the the two the two pieces of of solubility and permeability. Um, but certainly also we don't want to lose uh, sight of the patient and the use scenario. So as I mentioned, um, product design considerations and what we're trying to achieve through our therapeutic goals is a very important consideration and can dictate where we're at with regard to the decision-making process and, and the choice of route of delivery. So as I mentioned earlier, not all drugs are able to be delivered by all routes of delivery. Um, and in fact, even on the small molecule side, um, it would be a very unusual circumstance when the, uh, a given a treatment or a given molecule was able to be delivered through um, this wide variety of routes of delivery. But I wanted to introduce these concepts here um, as we'll talk about those more as we advance through um, the presentation. The, um, the route of delivery um, is an important consideration. And one thing that we, we talk about is kind of what's that therapeutic need and, and time to onset. So if, if this is an acute setting, um, an emergent setting, um, and we need a very, very rapid onset of action, this is you know uh, the, the, the standard, the gold standard with regard to onset of action would be an intravenous type of an injection. It's immediately bioavailable in the system. Um, and can get to the site, intended site of action and have the desired effect. Um, other parenteral um, routes of delivery like intramuscular injection, a subcutaneous injection, um, and even an oral buccal tablet or a nasal or, or um, pulmonary inhalation can have a very rapid onset of, of action as well. Um, tablets and capsules and particularly modified release tablets tend to be more on the order of minutes to hours to achieve their therapeutic effect and modified release or enteric coated or coated tablets, delayed release tablets can, um, can delay the, uh, the, the effect, uh, onset of effect um, for several hours um, after the time of administration. And then also when we think about depot injections or implants, we can have a, a you know, long time before we see days uh, to even weeks before we see full onset of action um, and, and of course, the duration of action for those types of dosage forms can be quite extended as well. Um, another in, important consideration uh, from a patient facing standpoint is, is really um, kind of preferred routes of delivery. And this is a, uh, a snapshot from I think 2019 March from PharmaCircle. And really it, what it does is it illustrates um, um, the, the products that are on the market, approved products or products that are in the development and pipeline and the route of administration um, that, that they are using. And so you can see here that by far um, oral administration and injection administration is our, our, the, the leader by far with regard to the frequency of, of route of administration. Although inhalations, ophthalmic, topical, uh, other um, 
are not insignificant and really very useful for certain specific uh, um, indications and, and treatments as we'll talk about um, in a few minutes. So I really wanna bring us back to talking to small molecule and the oral uh, route of delivery and this concept of biopharmaceutics because I think this is really important to understand and, and still forms a, a large basis of, uh, of, of the discussion and the decision-making process um, for a formulation scientist for small molecules. Um, and really the, the key here is, is to just think about the GI tract, if you will, as, as, a, as a tube, as a cylinder, right? And, and as we think about key parameters of moving a drug through that cylinder with the ability to, to get it out of that cylinder absorbed into the rest of the body, some of the key parameters are, what's the total dose that we need to deliver? Um, the solubility of the drug in that environment, the permeability of the drug, the ability for it to go through the tissues into the bloodstream to have the desired effect, um, the volume of material um, or, or, or liquid in the GI tract and the time that it takes for that material to go through that tube are all uh, key elements and considerations and kind of form the basis at a high level for this concept of, of biopharmaceutics from an oral delivery standpoint. So we come back to this notion, how much drug can be absorbed? And, and, and we use an equation, it's a very simple equation um, to try to estimate or anticipate what the maximum absorbable dose would be for a given drug. And it really breaks down into a series of, of three constants, an absorption rate constant, and some assumptions based on small intestinal volume, small intestine focus because this is really where the greatest surface area for absorption exists within the GI tract um, and where most absorption, whether it be food or, or pharmaceuticals occurs. Um, and then the transit time through that portion of the GI tract, that small intestine. And for the case of these examples, we'll, we'll talk about a four and a half hour or so window. Um, and so really the, the, the variable then becomes this concept of, of solubility. Right now, permeability also is involved in that absorption rate constant, and and we'll talk about that as well. That's we can make some estimates or establish what that permeability absorption rate constant is, and so really it becomes a a, a question of solubility in the physiological environment. To simplify this a little bit, um, in 1995, Gordon Avedon up at the University of Michigan and co-authors published. Uh, a paper, um, a biopharmaceutics classification system. And this is a, a, a foundational uh, piece of literature and a concept that's based on risk that really provides a lot of guidance to formulation scientists for how to formulate drugs. And uh, as I mentioned, it really is a risk-based system. And you can see uh, from our prior conversation, if you've got a drug that's highly soluble, if you've got a drug that is highly permeable, they're really very low risk. And we call these BCS class one molecules. And it gives us a lot of flexibility if our API has those properties, our drug substance has those high solubility and permeability properties. The formulation approach that we take, I won't say that it doesn't matter. It does matter from a patient and a quality standpoint, but from a, a, a drug absorption standpoint, it probably has very little impact. So for a BCS class one molecule, if I, made it as a tablet or a capsule or an oral liquid, it probably would not affect substantially the rate and extent of absorption of the drug. However, for a BCS class four molecule that has very low solubility, very low permeability relative to the amount of drug that we need to deliver, you could put that drug into the GI tract and it will just pass through with almost no drug being absorbed and just excreted out um, with the feces. And so the bottom line here is, is we, we, we break the, our drug substances down into this binary solu high solubility, low solubility, high permeability, low permeability. It has significance from a regulatory standpoint um, and, and, and it's adopted and embraced by um, regulators around the globe in the US in particular. Um, and it really forms a, a nice way for us to talk about um, biopharmaceutics going forward. So when we talk about designing for in vivo performance then, the getting the drug out of the uh, gut into the systemic circulation, 
we use this noise Whitney um, equation as kind of a foundational equation. And I'm gonna just simplify this if I can by saying um, the amount of material, the mass M at, that can be delivered as a function of time really breaks down into two key um, attributes. It's the surface area for dissolution of the drug times its saturation solubility. Now, in this instance, um, the rigorous noise Whitney equation, we talk about the concentration of the drug at the surface of a dissolving particle versus the concentration C sub B of the concentration of the drug in the bulk um, of the media or solution around that drug. But if we can make an assumption that the, that the concentration at the surface of a particle is effectively the saturation solubility of that drug substance, and that C sub B, the concentration in the bulk is effectively zero because that drug is being absorbed into the body. We can simplify this equation down and really talk about abilities to enhance absorption and bioavailability through either A, increasing the dissolution rate of the drug through surface area increase or by creating a kinetically stable, higher saturated solution of the drug in the intestine. So we talk about this in terms of how do you increase surface area? Well, it's very simple. It's all about particle size for drug substances. We can micronize the material, even nano size the material and get it into a, a, a very small particle size with a very high surface for dissolution. And that can really improve the dissolution rate in vivo of a drug and substantially improve and increase the bioavailability. This is a very common approach that's taken um, in, in pharmaceutics. The other approach um, to increasing that, that concentration is through um, presenting the drug in a way that is more easily dissolved or in, as a higher soluble state. Now we talked about salt previously um, and showed an example about um, when we used a hydrochloride salt versus a, a mesylate salt. In this instance, I'd like to talk a little bit about creating a solid dispersion. So if you go back and recall what we talked about on the API about amorphous materials, we talked about them naturally having a higher solubility, increased molecular mobility, but we talked about the risk of what happens when you don't control that. Well, there's an opportunity if we can control it and through the judicious use of technology and excipients, we we'll talk about in this instance, a spray dried dispersion where we're intentionally creating a amorphous solid material that will have a kinetically higher solubility and dissolution rate with the intent of delivering more drug through the intestinal wall and getting us to the concentration and therapeutic effect that we need. So designing for in vivo performance then, we'll talk about this example of, of Zelvaraf. It was originally approved in December uh, 2011 for metastatic melanoma for patients with a specific BRAF B600E mutation. And similarly, a reapproved or approved with additional indication on this, uh, on Erdheim Chester disease, a, a very rare disease with that same BRAF mutation. But if you look at the solubility of this drug, going back to you know, what we were talking about, our assumptions, um, you'd for practical purposes, need a swimming pool full of liquid to be able to dissolve the therapeutic dose of this drug. And since most of us aren't accommodated to drinking quite that much fluid, um, we, we knew that we really needed to do something to um, enhance the amount of drug in solution in, in the gut to allow for um, effective therapeutic concentration. In the initial phase one studies for this molecule, the sponsor chose to take the first approach, increase A. And we're very aggressive with regard to micronizing the drug substance, but yet still an unacceptably low and highly variable um, bioavailability in those early clinical studies. Subsequently, they reformulated um, the drug substance as a, a solid dispersion in a ratio of three parts drug to seven parts of a polymer called hydroxypropyl methylcellulose acetate succinate, which created this solid, uh, stable, amorphous dispersion that was able to be dosed. And we saw a 5%, or they saw a 5% increase in exposure, much reduced variability. And now this drug is able to be uh, 
a, a high quality, consistently performing uh, marketed drug through the use of a stable uh, amorphous solid dispersion. So we'll talk a little bit now about designing for in vivo performance. We talked about this notion of, of achieving a, a target plasma concentration or get how much drug we can get into the body. And this graph here on the right just simply shows um, a couple concepts with regard to um, the release profile of the drug out of the dosage form um, and how that might affect the ability to keep um, a patient in the therapeutic range, um, potentially um, extend the, the, the duration of uh, time in that range and reduce the dosing frequency. Um, and it can also provide a lot of benefit um, for narrow therapeutic index drugs if we're dealing with peak to trough issues, um, keeping patients below uh, a toxic or to non-tolerable range, and yet preventing them from dropping below into a subtherapeutic range through some technology and formulation. And so I really like to take a little time to talk through some of this. The key here then is we talk about modifying that release as opposed to ingesting the drug and the drug is immediately made available to um, the, the GI tract for dissolution and absorption. We're going to control the release of the drug out of the dosage form to achieve that therapeutic effect that we want. And why do we do this? Um, I mentioned a couple of the reasons um, on the previous slide, um, but to reiterate, it can really improve overall efficacy. It has the ability to reduce side effects by controlling peak and trough um, levels, uh, or plasma concentration. Um, it could provide an opportunity to take a drug that needs to be administered twice or three or four times a day and turn that into something that might only be needed to be administered uh, once a day, which will help improve uh, patient compliance and, and give us a, a, the therapeutic outcome we want. And it can also be used um, along those lines for some competitive differentiation. Modified release can be used for multiple types of, 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 of routes of delivery. So it can be oral, it could be parenteral. We'll even see an ocular example um, at, and for topical products as, as well. The um, uh, typically this is used for um, synthetic molecules. Um, the technology around uh, delivery of, of biologics through uh, sustained action typically doesn't happen through the formulation approach. A lot of times that's engineered into the molecule itself. Um, we won't get into that dialogue um, in this talk today, but I think you'll have some exposure to that in uh, uh, either previous or upcoming um, modules in the course. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about particularly um, sustained release, but I've listed out the different types. I've shown an example here with uh, um, aspirin, 81 milligram aspirin that many, many folks take um, as a cardio, uh, cardiovascular protecting. Um, but we know that the, the acetylsalicylic acid in the, uh, in the product itself can at times create GI upset for patients. And so we simply put a enteric coating, which prevents that drug from going into solution in the stomach, relieves the potential risk for indigestion or, or, or um, acidosis in the stomach and um, provides a much, much better uh, patient experience. And that's just through uh, the use of a polymer to prevent the drug from going uh, into solution in the stomach. So let's talk about a couple of different modified release technologies um, uh, that are very common, commonly used. The first I'll talk about is a hydrophilic matrix tablet where the drug is mixed with excipients um, that actually are hydrophilic uh, polymers that will, will hydrate and swell. Um, and, and as that product hits the, um, the, the gastric contents, the drug will be, or the, the, the tablet will begin to absorb water, it will begin to swell, um, and it will create a viscous uh, gel layer around the outside of the dry core of the tablet. Outside hydrates quickly um, and creates almost like a gel coat around the tablet. And then the drug slowly diffuses through that, that gel coat. In addition, that, that gel coat, as it hydrates greater, more, more water and, and the viscosity will drop at the surface, that, that gel layer will erode. And so the tablet will, will, will become smaller and smaller, but the drug release occurs over a period of time. And we can manipulate those polymers um, to really dial in how fast 
we want that drug to release or how long we want that tablet to stay intact. A similar technology is a reservoir controlled uh, release technology, where as opposed to a polymer that will swell and erode, we'll put a film on the surface of the tablet, uh, a polymer, a semi-permeable me membrane, and water will ingress into that, um, through that membrane. It will solubilize the drug within that um, membrane, and then slowly over time, the dissolved drug substance will, will be able to leach out through that, that membrane and uh, create a sustained release effect. So a couple of very common modified release technologies I wanted to, to share. But there are potential risks and disadvantages with regard to modified release. Typically what we're doing in those instances is putting multiple doses of product um, of the drug substance into a single product with the intent that that will play out over an extended period of time. Um, and so the actual drug load or amount of drug in those extended release formulations tends to be greater than if it was an immediate release product for um, administration. And, and so the risk there then becomes is what happens if the dosage form fails and all of that drug uh, releases into the system at the same time. And that could be a failure of the, of the dosage form itself if it's not well designed and controlled, or it, it can be as a result of extraneous effect or an intentional effect. So we talk frequently, particularly around um, the hydrophilic matrices around alcohol-induced dose dumping. Um, so when patients, um, they, they, they may continue um, alcohol consumption, even though um, it's not recommended in many instances when we're taking a medication. Um, in this instance, uh, the data here by Leonardus uh, et al. Uh, led to uh, the withdrawal of a product, Paladone XL, which was a hydromorphone uh, sustained release product um, from the market because, <clears throat> excuse me, of the dose dumping potential in relation to alcohol and um, some adverse events, serious adverse events that had occurred. Um, and then I talked about the intentional misuse of, of products as well. And we're all familiar with the um, the crisis in the United States with regard to abuse potential and in, in, in opioids, but other therapies as well. Uh, methylphenidate is an example, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But formulation science can also provide a deterrent. And so courtesy of Pfizer, I can share this um, uh, image, right, of their Embedda morphine sulfate naltrexone combination product. And really the whole driver here is um, to avert or minimize the, 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 the um, abuse potential of this drug through uh, technology that um, allows for the morphine sulfate to be released through a rate controlling membrane, if you remember the reservoir um, design that we talked about before. But yet in the core of this um, pellet, as you can see that it's a capsule that's comprised of multiple pellets, there is naltrexone in that core. So if a patient were to take and open that capsule and try to crush those beads um, and release all the drug immediately um, um, to get high or to have that, um, that, that, that high therapeutic concentration of, of, uh, of morphine sulfate, it will release the naltrexone and that will avert a serious adverse event with regard to um, overdose. On the methylphenidate uh, example, I wanted to share a, a unique technology. Um, Alza Corporation developed this a number of years ago for um, and is being used in the commercial Concerta product. Um, and in this instance, you have an immediate release component of drug overcoat on the outside of the dosage form, which releases the drug very rapidly. But then um, there is a semi-permeable membrane around a three component system within that tablet um, a cap, I guess I should call it a capsule uh, shaped tablet. And what happens is that water will ingress through that semi-permeable membrane. It will hydrate the push compartment, solubilize um, the drug in the drug compartment one, drug compartment two, and through a laser drilled hole at the end, the osmotic pressure builds up inside that film and it will push slowly push uh, additional drug outside uh, into the gastric contents for absorption as a function of time. And so basically it takes a, a three time a day 
methylphenidate dose and provides an effectively equivalent therapeutic concentration without the peaks and valleys that you would see um, if you can take a look at the uh, plasma profile concentrations from the Concerta package insert and provides a more convenient and more um, therapeutically constant delivery of methylphenidate. So um, back to uh, some broader considerations on, on route of delivery. What I'd like to do now is, is finish by going through um, a kind of a survey of, of, of different routes and why we would use them, advantages and disadvantages um, for those different um, uh, approaches. So we talked a lot about oral formulations today and for good reason, they are um, the most common formulations that are on the market across um, uh, synthetic molecules today. Um, there are a lot of advantages to, to, to uh, immediate release IR tablets and capsules. Uh, they're very dose accurate. They're stable. They're portable, familiar to patients. Um, they're easy to identify from a safety standpoint. They have a relatively low cost to manufacture. And while they do have some limitations, those limitations are, are fairly minor. Um, again, there's only so much drug that you can get into a, a tablet or a capsule that is able to easily be swallowed by a patient. Um, they do run the risk. We talked about, before about pill crushing, pill splitting, dose splitting. Um, we see that as a, a, you know, a, a potential disadvantage to this type of dosage form. But by and large, this is a very common, very effective way to um, uh, deliver drugs orally. We talked a lot about modified release tablets and some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, around that. So I won't go into a lot of detail here. Um, just to remember that um, from a manufacturing and a quality standpoint, a lot of times these dosage forms require some specialized excipients, some specialized technology. Um, and so, um, and, and not every drug is really amenable to this type of uh, uh, approach. And so it, it does take a, a certain circumstance, a set of physical chemical characteristics and therapeutic need um, to, um, to go the route of a modified release, but is a very common technology nonetheless, and something that a formulator can look to um, leverage to improve outcomes. Uh, other oral uh, routes, um, uh, orally disintegrating tablets are a popular dosage form um, that we see uh, more and more frequently, and particularly um, in space like migraine, uh, where acute relief is um, of, of primary importance to the patient. Um, like standard dosage forms, um, these are dose accurate. They're stable, although physically robust. Uh, the physical robustness tends to be a little less for the ODTs, um, a little more difficult to handle, a little less robust. Sometimes they require physical um, support through packaging, um, as opposed to a multi-count bottle, we may use a blister pack, um, but they can be discreet, they're portable. Um, in many instances, no need to take with water. Um, and there's a perception of onset of speed with this dosage form that, um, that many patients experience as well. Even though at times that may not be supported by the pharmacokinetic data, um, it, it is a reality. I want to draw a specific distinction between oral disintegrating tablets and buccal or sublingual tablets because they're not the same. Um, while the buccal or sublingual dosage form will dissolve in the oral cavity, the, the drug substance um, is absorbed through the oral mucosa with a buccal or a sublingual tablet that's designed for systemic action as opposed to the orally disintegrating tablet, which is really just to disperse quickly and then be swallowed with the saliva and absorbed through the GI tract. So buccal and sublingual tablets are fairly uncommon and they really require a, a molecule to be, to be designed to support that route of administration. I use the nitrostat example here. Uh, we're familiar with that. It's a uh, very low molecular weight um, drug that's absorbed very rapidly through the oral mucosa and can give, her, and can give a very rapid onset of, uh, of action. Um, we also um, can use buccal or sublingual dosage forms for, for local delivery um, for treatment um, just within the, the oral cavity itself. And in those instances, then absorption of the drug um, uh, for, uh, into the systemic circulation is really not uh, a consideration. Um, 
rounding out oral formulations. Um, we talk about oral thin films. It's kind of a, a niche emerging uh, a dosage form. Um, can have some advantages for certain indications, uh, similar to the ODT, oral dispersible tablet in many regards, um, discrete. Um, the nice thing about the ODTs and the thin films are that for certain psychiatric indications, um, it can really avoid uh, cheeking of the, the, the dosage form. So if, if the patient takes the dosage form into the mouth, it really ensures that they will get the drug um, uh, as opposed to cheeking a, a, a tablet and then, you know, when the nurse walks away in an institutional setting, spitting it out um, and avoiding their therapy. And then, of course, oral liquids um, uh, play a role um, for many patient populations uh, with regard to an oral formulation, just in a different form. Um, the nice things about oral liquids is it really provides a lot of dosing flexibility um, and uh, can and be a, a great dosage form for patients that have a difficulty swallowing uh, a solid oral dosage form. Some disadvantages are around taste um, and, and, and really the, the dosing device and, and dosing error. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the very end, um, but it's very important that these products are designed and provided um, with the appropriate dosing device that's well designed to avoid uh, dosing errors, because in many instances, these products are actually being measured or dosed by the patient or a caregiver themselves, and the risk is, is, is high. Um, and then, of course, there are additional physical, chemical, and microbiological attributes of uh, oral liquids that need to be taken into consideration as well. Um, there's some sprays, lozenges, gums, granules. We won't talk about those, but each of these has its uh, specific advantages and limitations. And depending upon the disease state, the patient population, and the desired therapeutic outcome um, can be very useful formulation approaches. Um, a little bit on parenteral um, formulations and some key uh, quality attributes here I want to talk through um, really around sterility, um, microbiological, endotoxin stability, particulate matter, uh, uh, sterility, excuse me, um, very key critical quality attribute um, uh, considerations here. Um, sterilization methods for parenteral formulations, um, you can see on the top right, um, a, a number. Filtration is, is really a very a common and effective uh, approach to take. Heat, a little less because the drug itself would need to be um, stable through the heat cycle. And we know that um, heat can really create problems from a, a chemical or even a physical stability standpoint. Um, gas and, and, and ethylene oxide and, and radiation are also alternative um, uh, sterilization methods that can be looked at in the in the instance that filtration um, or heat may not be applicable. Um, we, we, additional considerations on chemical and physical stability and interactions with the packaging, we call extractables and leachables, are, are really important um, uh, attributes with regard to a parenteral formulation, as well as the formulation composition itself, the isotonicity, the pH, the volume to administer, the viscosity. All of these things are, are really important. I've highlighted um, isotonicity here, um, but they, uh, they, they have to be uh, well thought through and designed to avoid, for example, hemolysis on injection, injection site reactions, a pain on injection to the patient, um, the volume to administer, certainly for a, a large volume IV, uh, less constraints, but if we're talking about a subcutaneous injection, obviously very volume constrained with regard to how much we can administer through that route. Um, again, I talked a little bit about these uh, types already. Uh, IV parenteral formulations, typically infusion or in, um, injection. Um, they can be lyophilized powders for reconstitution at the pharmacy um, or a ready-made solution for in injection. These are typically delivered in the infusion center or a hospital setting. Um, intramuscular injection, um, interesting uh, about these, they can be very rapid onset, not as quick as IV, but still a rapid onset, but can also be effective for sustained release uh, application, uh, depot injection through formulation uh, technology. There are again, volume limitations, site of administration uh, limitations, um, 
needle length and, and, and viscosity plays very closely with um, syringe ability um, and the gauge of the needle, making sure that those are designed to work together. Um, but it's typically a, a, a provider administered um, parenteral route. Um, subcutaneous injection, um, uh, very common these days, uh, seeing more and more with regard to antibody therapies, the monoclonal antibodies delivered through sub-Q injections, diabetes um, de delivered through um, subcutaneous uh, injections, the diabetes therapies, excuse me. And, um, and they have a, a relatively rapid onset of action. Um, frequently, these are self-administered dosage forms. Um, um, and constraints are, are in place with regard to volume, but that's an area of a lot of innovation these days with regard to um, the, the uh, volume to be able to uh, administer. And as I, I shared earlier, um, you know, patient choice, um, the connected devices, the insulin pumps are, are all new subcutaneous um, route of delivery um, uh, approaches that I think we'll see more and more of um, going forward. And then lastly, intradermal injection. It's, a, it's fairly specific in, in, in a less common limited route. I wanted to make sure that we um, uh, illustrated that as well. You see that with regard to allergy testing, TB tests, and, uh, and some vaccine and novel oncology applications. Uh, lastly, um, I just wanted to address or, or make you aware of um, parenteral formulation with regard to um, subdermal implants. And these tend to be um, very long acting um, implants um, to provide a chronic effect for um, months or even years. Um, quickly on nasal drug delivery, um, it, this can be uh, uh, systemic or local. Um, there are certainly um, uh, volume constraints with regard to the amount of material that can be delivered nasally, uh, requires a potent drug. Um, these can be solutions or suspension nasal sprays. They can also be dry powders. Um, and there's a lot of emerging data now on uh, an investigation on, on using the nasal route to deliver uh, directly to, to the brain and, and avoiding, in some regards, the, the, the blood-brain barrier. Um, these can have a very rapid um, exposure and systemic effect. And uh, I think it's an area um, that we'll see uh, more and more therapies uh, looking to the nasal route of delivery going forward. Pulmonary inhalations, um, advantages here are really a very higher local concentration um, to the target tissue, the lung. Um, it, it avoids the first pass effect of the oral route and the higher exposure of uh, uh, drugs to other potential organs um, by going directly to the lung. These are frequently self-administered um, preparations. Um, some of the disadvantages are, as you might expect, um, you know, potential toxicity to the lung tissue itself, either through the drug or from the formulation components. Um, it, it, and it has the, the potential over a long chronic use period to alter the, the natural lung defenses. And so this is something that um, a lot of science and engineering going into ensuring that the way that these products are, are designed and formulated can really minimize that risk. You can uh, get systemic exposure um, through the lungs. And so another very important consideration um, with regard to uh, potential off-target uh, toxicities um, for these types of, of products. And it really requires a very thoughtful, careful uh, particle design strategy and uh, device design strategy as well. Transdermal patches are something that can be very effective for certain patient populations. Um, it can be uh, really serve as a, a Kind of a modified release or a longer acting dosage form. Um, the dose to deliver is really typically very limited, um, but the and the and the drug itself needs to be able to be absorbed through um, the skin. A lot of times we'll see the use of um, permeation enhancers. Um, sometimes those permeation enhancers can in themselves cause irritation or or have a deleterious effect. Um, typically, we need to rotate the site of application. Um, but the dosage form is discrete, um, and, it, and it can be uh, an effective way to deliver therapy in this instance, um, uh, you know, for uh, Alzheimer's patients um, to help cognition with the Exelon ripostigmine patch. 
Um, topical ocular otic formulations are all uh, ways that drugs can be delivered. Um, they all have their specific um, utility, um, really targeted for local action in most instances. Um, I draw your attention to, we talked about modified release um, earlier in the use of polymers um, to the OcuCert um, pilocarpine um, uh, product that I've illustrated here. Um, employs a lot of the same um, membrane and, and drug releasing uh, technology that we talked about for the modified release um, in the oral use scenario. But important to note that these are also sterile preparations for the eye, for the ear, and, um, and so all the considerations around sterility um, um, play a very important role with these types of formulations as well. Um, vaginal and rectal suppositories are not a very common um, dosage form, but certainly one that can uh, be used for both local or systemic delivery can accommodate higher doses. Um, and, um, and typically, uh, we see this um, either special patient populations or um, in, the, in, in the event that nausea or emesis would prevent um, an oral ingestion. And, and vaginal uh, suppositories are typically for, um, for local therapy. So coming to the end here, um, talk a little bit about packaging and labeling. And I, I referred to this earlier. Um, it, it's really that holistic uh, design of the product. So the formulation, we've spent a lot of time talking about, um, but the way that formulation is, is presented is, is critically important as well. How will it be packaged? Will it maintain, this, the packaging maintains stability? Will it be able to be shipped and stored um, and maintain its, its activity? Um, how will the dose form be administered? Um, will a device be required? If so, who will use that device and how is that designed? Um, and the instructions to the caregiver for how to use that device. Um, can they really be understood? Um, I share this image of an oral dosing syringe to highlight um, a point that, of, of emphasis in the United States around the way that devices are, are created. And in this instance, you can see a scenario where there's actually two scales on this syringe, and which is really not a good practice. Um, in this instance, there can easily be confusion with regard to uh, the user with which scale should I use? And if the instruction said to deliver two mils, it would not be uh, the scale on the right-hand side. It would not be uncommon um, in human factor studies to see a use error where the where the user would actually draw it up to the two on the left side of the scale, which is a two teaspoon um, uh, amount to administer and effectively a 5X overdose of the drug. And when, uh, particularly for oral liquids, that patient population tends to be children, um, this could be a very serious adverse uh, outcome. Quick word on alternative administration. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about the design of the device, uh, design of the, um, a dosage form and how they could or should be used. Unfortunately, our products can't always be used um, as or taken as designed. And so as a formulation scientist, we also think a lot about uh, potential alternative use scenarios. How could our product be modified, for example, to administer through a G-tube or an NG tube? Um, would you disperse a capsule or a tablet? Um, would that plug the tube? What about compatibility? Um, what about using food um, to administer? I, I, I have an excerpt here from uh, uh, product labeling for the Orcambi pediatric uh, oral granule dosage form that illustrates a very specific information to be provided on the appropriate way to use and administer um, the dosage form. But the key message here is while um, there are many, many ways in the real world that patients may use our products, um, it's really important not to be so focused on communicating all the things that they can do, but more importantly, if there is something that we know that they should not do, if there is a risk associated with the drug, its manipulation, its stability, we need to make sure that we're communicating that in the product label. We talked a little bit about these special patient populations and they deserve special consideration in formulation development, a lot of legislation over the last 15 years or so in both the US and Europe around pediatrics. I'm anticipating legislation around um, uh, elderly, uh, designing for elderly patients, and certainly always that specific disease state um, uh, 
consequence to the patient where maybe they're suffering for dysphagia and Parkinson's disease or, or PSP. And, and these are things that we need to really be paying attention to. So in summary, it's about bringing all of these um, domains together, the patient considerations, the technical considerations, at times business considerations, and ensuring that we're developing high quality, safe and efficacious formulations. And, um, and so I hope that after this uh, lecture, you have a better understanding of some of the key um, learning objectives that we stated at the beginning. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and have a great day.